What? You can see the difference in size. What? I never see. There's, it's <laughs> so cute. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So this is an actual quail plucker. Yes, this is a quail plucker. You could buy. Hey guys, um, my name is Clara Zander. I'm the owner and manager at the Wildway Farm. Um, we're an ecological farm based out uh, like 30 minutes outside of Asheville, North Carolina. We raise pastured quail. We do pasture and woodland raised pork. There he is. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart. They're Idaho pasture pigs. They're a, a newer breed yeah. as of uh, 2006. They're wonderful. They don't root. They were. So far as, um, so long as they're given proper minerals and um, in a general sense their, you know, dietary needs are met, mm -hmm. they don't root. Uh, they've been in this spot for about two weeks now. You think this, this, type, this type of breed is good for like, say, for us, like on one and a half acres? Yes, absolutely. Because they make use of your pasture, mm -hmm. um, they are a smaller breed than, tr you know, conventional meat breeds. They're wonderful. I mean, as long as you give them what they need and provide them proper minerals um, and move them relatively consistently, um, they don't damage your land. They're like the only pigs I ever want to raise. I've worked with Berkshires, I've worked with really? Tamworths, okay. Old Spots. Um, they're just amazing. And then we're also uh, working on breeding tri-purpose chickens for meat, eggs, and feathers. And we sell our chicken eggs um, locally. You can find our quail meat in a few local stores um, at some local restaurants. And we're also really passionate about using the whole animal uh, when we harvest. This Airstream's a processor facility, processing facility? Yeah, it's a, a quail processing facility. So we're FDA approved. Um, to harvest our quail and then sell really anywhere. Yeah. Did you buy the Airstream for a processing facility? Yes. You did? Yes. Okay, that's awesome. I wish I just had an Airstream sitting around, yeah. but I don't want to have to stare at something that's hideous. So yeah. I found this, it was a total steal. We do our killing here. Um, everybody gets harvested and then bodies go in a bin. Um, we have a gut bin. And then we'll set up our scalder here. Um, so how do you, um, like, Dispatch them. Dispatch them? Yeah. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, you use scissors. Okay. Um, I've heard it, that. But. Yeah, it's. Uh, I have harvested a lot of animals in my life, yeah. um, from like pigs to geese to chickens, and for whatever reason, cutting something's head off is just a little strange for me yes. with scissors. Um, yes. So it still gets me, even though we've been doing it all season. Um, so do you just like hold them down or put them in a cone? So I used two people because I okay. want them to have a clean end mm -hmm. and um, it's also safer. Oh my gosh. So That's cute. crazy. Like, yeah. So this is an actual quail plucker. Yes, this is a quail. And you could buy it. Yes. People could buy it. <laughs> I think it was like 130 maybe. What? So if you were to use this big one, <laughs> would that destroy them? Yeah, so I, uh, uh, the first, I did a couple <laughs> trial harvests in here just to make sure everything was how we needed it. And I tried to put the quail in the chicken plucker. Would not recommend. You end up with um, pulverized. Really? Birds, okay. Like broken bones. It was not pretty. How often do you butcher the quail? Is it once a week? Once a week. Really? Yeah. Once a week, okay. I think the most we've done is 170 in a day. We had four people that day, but usually it's one or two people in here. So it's yeah. me and a friend of mine, or me and Zach. Or... It's long days. Whenever we harvest our quail for meat, um, some portion of our harvest gets skinned, and those skins get processed and then sold. Um, typically to fly tires, but really anybody that's interested in some beautiful quality feathers. Everything that we do is uh, is focused on uh, taking care of the land and giving our animals the best life that we possibly can. We're in our nursery right now. Um, this is where we hatch and start all of our quail. Um, every, our breeders live in our aviary right next door and we'll collect eggs and then they go in our, our incubators um, and then they get hatched in the, the second incubator on the right here. Um, and then from there, they'll go in one of these two brooder boxes between 100 and 125, um, you know, day old to week old chicks here. And then at week two, they move up. Um, and then at week three, we'll split the brood 
um, give them some more space, and they'll stay in here off of heat uh, for a final week. So when they turn four weeks old is when we bring them out to pasture. Oh my gosh, it's always quail. <laughs> so many quail. The foundation birds uh, I hatched out this spring um, in January, eight to ten weeks. The males will start being sexually active at like six to eight weeks, and then the females start laying between eight and ten weeks usually. This one's a male, and this one's a female. The female's got these polka dots, and the male doesn't. Oh, okay. You can also, with the Italians, you can tell on their heads, the males get that like cinnamon color on their face. How do you like these? Do they use them? Oh, I think they're great. They yeah. do get a little dirty. Like, they'll right. kick stuff in there and it's kind of a pain in the butt. But, right. Um, well, these are the ones I use. Than, uh, are they out? Like, if there's too many roosters or, or too many hens, do they kill each other? <laughs> or is um, there a problem? <laughs> <laughs> I... The biggest issue I have seen with them fighting is uh, when they're in the, um, the pasture houses and they have less space. Um, okay. They will totally cannibalize each other. I haven't yeah. had that issue. Yeah. Um, we do give them, you know, enough space. Fertility-wise, we try and do one male to seven females in here. Um, I have heard people say better fertility is like one to five, but the females definitely get beat up a little bit. Yeah. So, this is yeah. this is something I've wanted to see because we just got some quail. You guys raise quail. Perfect opportunity to learn about quail. They come out on pasture and um, the beginning of four weeks and then we harvest them at eight weeks old. All these houses get moved every day. How many do you have in each one about? The average is, is probably like 110 um, per house. And I would like for next year the groups to be a little smaller in here so they have a little bit more space. Do you have to go inside at all? Yeah, you... so some people, the thing with quail is they like to fly straight up in the air when they're scared. Um, and so you have to choose when you're building their infrastructure if you want something that is 12 inches tall or six feet tall. Because any height in between, um, you know, over a foot and under six feet, they're very likely to fly up and break their necks um, or seriously injure themselves. So we chose to do the six foot houses um, so that we can go in there easier and you know check on them better so when you open the door they won't like fly out I definitely have to <laughs> take some breaths and just like y they pick up on on how you're feeling if I go in there and I'm in a hurry all hell breaks loose so <laughs> you just like they're they're flighty they're game birds they're flighty um, so the box is not only for them to be able to hide in um, and feel protected but when we go to move them every day I'll go in and get as many in it as I can and make sure everybody's ultimately in the box. I'll like usually have to catch some and okay. put them in, but then they get locked in the box. Um, we scoot them forward, we'll feed water, check on everything, make sure there's no holes, and then they get let back out. Do you think if you didn't have the box, it would be harder to move? Yes, especially okay. the way that we designed these, um, or that he designed them, I should say, with the, the hard panel on the side, mm -hmm. um, you have to lift it completely. Like, I have to lift the house about to waist height. I see. Um, when I move it, and if that happened and they oh, were okay. all out, they just go. This pipe is, oh, that's our, that's our water. That's our water. Okay, awesome. One day we want to um, change up our feeding situation, but right now, Zach converted some old gutters into feeding troughs, we cut them in half. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have some additional independent ones. Oh, okay. No, that's great. Now, do you ever give the quail um, grit at all? Mm. Or I don't know if they need that or... They do, they definitely need it. They're just like chickens with, uh, okay. you know, they have a gizzard. Um, they definitely need those stones to help grind stuff up. I like to start them with a little bit of, um, they make parakeet grit. Not sure why, because parakeets don't need grit, but um, that super, super fine, like almost sand. Mm -hmm. I'll throw some of that in the first week that they're in the nursery um, and get them started. And then when they come out here, um, they usually can find some stuff. All right, what I want to know, so how'd you guys um, start farming? Like, how'd you get into it? Uh, I started farming, um, I started raising chickens when I was nine. I started uh, 
breeding chickens when I was 11 or 12. And then uh, I started working at Stone Barns in New York um, when I was 14. And I worked there for about four years and fell in love with it. I just kind of never stopped. I worked on farms all over the country and um, had birds, had a little homestead when I moved to Asheville for college. Um, and then I went to, to college for sustainable ag and uh, conservation biology. And you guys are on Instagram? We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, and we have a website, www.thewildwayfarm.com.